Here is our sit-down interview with Joel Skousen, editor of World Affairs Brief. Skousen was the chairman of the Conservative National Committee in the 1980s and the executive editor of Conservative Digest. Skousen talks about the hidden power structure who control the politicians of both parties from behind the scenes, the nature of the manipulated press, the reality behind the Tea Party, and the ongoing conspiracy to complete a one-world dictatorship. I'm Joel Skousen, editor of World Affairs Brief. Um, I'm a political scientist by training, was the former chairman of the Conservative National Committee during the Reagan administration, and have been active uh, ever since in uh, trying to alert people to what's going on in, in the world. Today, uh, I'd like to start off by talking about the reasons that a dialectic uh, uh, philosophy of conflict is used by the opposition, or at least the opposition to liberty. I think this is very important to understand that there is real systematic good and evil in the world. Uh, it isn't just uh, happenstance that someone uh, turns out to be evil. There is systematic evil in the world, meaning it's self-generating, it continues, it, p it picks people to follow along. Uh, goodness, in contrast, is not that way. Uh, we try to raise good children, but we essentially uh, allow people to follow the path that they want to follow. But evil isn't that way. Evil wants to progenerate it, and it uses certain techniques to do this. And one of them is the dialectic. The dialectic is where you create crises in order to induce good people to do things or accept things that they wouldn't ordinarily do. Uh, the reason for this, that you need to deceive people, and we're in all of this, we're talking about the Tea Party deception, we're talking about the deception of political parties. We need to understand that deception is something that has always been with us in the world and always will because of this systematic battle between good and evil. But there is a systematic good as well, and that is the role of conscience in people. <clears throat> and it's because certain people can sense that something's wrong that evil has to use deception and dialectic in order to get people to uh, do things in spite of conscience, in spite of sensing that something's wrong. In essence, when you create a big enough crisis, there's a feeling of panic. We have no choice. Uh, we have no power to resist. There's this feeling of futility. So even though people can sense what's right in conscience, they don't act according to it or they follow along the path of least resistance because of the severity of the crisis. That's the reason why evil uses crises to change the world. When I was growing up, uh, I was first exposed to the writings of my uncle, W. Cleon Skousen, who wrote uh, The Naked Communist. The most dramatic story in that book and I still highly recommend it, uh, recommend it today. The most highly prized story in that book is the fall of China to Mao Zedong. Uh, and it was clearly outlined in the book how our own State Department, in, uh, in league with uh, George uh, Catlett Marshall, who was head of uh, our armed forces during World War II, actually uh, set about to destroy the power of Chiang Kai-shek to win the battles against Mao Zedong. They set him up for failure. They withdraw armed support from him so that he basically could not win against Mao. And I thought to myself, what's going on here? Uh, are these communists in our government? Was Catlett Marshall or was George Marshall a communist? Were the State Department people communist? So as I began to research this and talk to my uncle about it, I found out that they were not communists. There were communists in the State Department, especially the second floor, which had to do with foreign policy, did have some communists in it. And then there was the story of Alger Hiss, who was accused of being a communist. In fact, he did join the Communist Party. But there was something strange about Alger Hiss in that he was um, highly protected by the establishment, those that weren't communists. Uh, Whitaker Chambers is the one who outed Alger Hiss. Whitaker Chambers was a dedicated ideological Marxist communist. He repented of that, um, changed, uh, decided to uh, tell all. He was very, very honest. He was vilified for his honesty, and he's the one who named Alger Hiss. Uh, 
But the establishment came out for years. I mean, Alger Hiss went to prison eventually on perjury. Uh, the, the establishment never gave up on Alger Hiss. They always continued to support him. And one day a light came on in my mind and I realized, I think Alger Hiss was in fact a globalist. He's part of this broader conspiracy, was not a communist, but that in fact he joined the Communist Party to help facilitate Communist Party infiltration into the State Department, into the Roosevelt and Truman administrations, which is exactly what he did. But when he wrote the United Nations Charter, it became very clear this was more than just a communist, this was a globalist using communism to facilitate the goals of globalism. And so when I finally had this uh, new paradigm, this perspective, and this is something that no one else has ever written about, to my knowledge. Everyone in the conservative movement thinks that Alger Hiss was a communist. But it doesn't explain why the non-communists were defending him so vociferously. As I began to look historically at what was happening as nation after nation was falling uh, to communism, uh, later on, of course, they, they destroyed Batista of Cuba in the same way that they did of Mao Zedong in China. They pulled out military support. It was the second level of the State Department. Uh, we had planted reporters like um, uh, Herbert Matthews in the New York Times who would write these knifing uh, derogatory articles about Batista and these uh, uh, articles about how Fidel Castro was this reformer, how he was a person who was uh, the people's uh, man. He did the same hatchet job on Mao Zedong. Uh, later on, uh, Drew Pearson carried on uh, with Jack Anderson uh, in the Washington Merrigal Round. They were primarily responsible for bringing down Anastasio Somoza of Nicaragua, allowing the Sandinistas to come to power. Um, Anastasio Somoza had his flaws, certainly. He was a strong man, but he was pro-Western, very much uh, for free markets. Uh, he was clearly an ally of the West, and we destroyed him. Uh, why? They wanted the communists to come to power. Because they were communists? I don't think so. I think it's because the globalist view is that we can use communism to break down the existing social order. We can use communism to create even more horrific crimes and then we, the globalists, a moderate form of socialism that intertwines uh, predatory capitalism, mercantilism with socialism, we can come into the rescue, save people from communism and give them our version of the new world order, which people will then tend to accept. And they would not accept were we not to have the horrors of communism to pave the way. So that's... Uh, what I feel is, uh, is the important thing to realize is that communism, socialism, Fabian socialism, and there are tens of other variations of uh, enemies to the free market are all promoted to one uh, degree or another. In the same sense, um, the conspiracy has attempted to, has had the necessity of morphing into different organizations to be able to cover itself from discovery. We can go back, I think the cons conspiracy has been with us since the beginning of time, but when we begin, whether it's from Cain and Abel uh, or we uh, talk about the Illuminati starting in 1776, how ironic you know that there's this interplay between the movement of freedom in 1776 and the rise of a counter movement. It's almost as if Satan and God, or Satan follows and sees what God is trying to do to promote liberty and has a counter strategy. Um, in everything uh, that comes about. There are key dates in history, like 1776, when you had a massive liberty for movement, whereby for the first time in history you'd had some very principled libertarian-oriented people come into power. Uh, and at the same time you have this rise of the Illuminati. It got exposed. I believe it went underground and then began to use another organization, the Masonic uh, in uh, <clears throat> lodges uh, to take its place. When that became exposed, they dropped out the lower levels of the Masonic so that they became rather as uh, good old boy clubs uh, and they're still in use today. You can go into certain parts of Texas and you talk to people and there are most people uh, within a certain county are members of the lodge. Uh, 
And they know that if they get a traffic ticket, they can flash the ringer and they can get some type of immunity. Now, it isn't really illegal. It isn't anything to do with these broad range conspiracies. But it is a good old boys network and it allows people to rise within those networks and to be able to and the higher ups within those to see all right, who's corruptible, who's predictable, who can we bring along to a, a higher order or understanding. So it's my opinion that the Masonic level only participates in broad range conspiracy issues above the 32nd or 33rd level in the United States. In Europe, it's a different story. In the Europe, the Masonic lodges have been much more deeply involved in conspiratorial, globalist, and New World Order issues. <clears throat> and um, we find the Masonic lodges are still very powerful in, in uh, Italy, especially, in Spain, Germany, and France. Uh, so the, what I'm saying uh, or viewing is that uh, conspiratorial forces morph into different forms. They use different crises. Uh, and above all, they are able to imitate and co-opt goodness in a variety of ways. It's important that this is not to understand this is not a monolithic conspiracy of power. There are competing blocks. There's always competitors, just like in the drug trade, the United States runs its uh, own dark side drug trade to finance black operations. Um, and higher ups within the DEA and CIA are, are aware of these things. But there are always competitors coming up in the drug trade trying to uh, piggyback onto this very, very lucrative profession. And so it is this conspiracy. A conspiracy power has to give certain rewards to people. And that's why wealth is always a part of it, the inducement of wealth. It is not true, however, and I want to clarify one thing. Oftentimes in conspiratorial literature, such as uh, in Alan's book or um, uh, even in some of my uncle's book, you talk about the wealthy international bankers. Well, it is not true that every single international banker is involved in the conspiracy. It is not true that every wealthy banker is part of it. It is true that everyone who's part of it is wealthy. But it is not true that all big business is part of it or that all big banks are part of it. Uh, almost all are now because they don't like competition and they tend to try to co-opt. But there is this continual competition of power. Uh, in the world scene, I believe that there are three predator senators of power. I believe the most powerful and the longest running uh, structure of conspiracy to undermine liberty is what we call the Anglo-American uh, power center. Centered uh, primarily in London, uh, but now has got most of its power transferred over to New York and the United States just because that's where most of the wealth is. The other power is Russia and the other power is China. I believe that they are competing. They're temporary allies because they know that eventually the, they're going to be in a, a war with the Anglo-American establishment. Uh, but eventually they will have to fight it out among themselves. And I only say this about three competing senators of power that there has been a significant piece of disinformation which been, has been put out within our movement uh, that started with the Rowan Gaither quote. This is the quote that my uncle was the first one to publish this in his book, The Naked Capitalist, by W. Cleon Skousen. He talks about um, Norman Dodd of, uh, under a special house committee going to interview Rowan Gaither of the Ford Foundation and, Ro and asking him why is it that the foundations are always promoting communism and, and other socialist aspects uh, within the UN and elsewhere. And he said to Norman Dodd, he said, uh, the powerful forces uh, behind our foundation want to have the Soviet Union and Russia meld itself peacefully into one major organization, one peaceful uh, country. This, in my opinion, was disinformation. In the first place, Rowan Gaither, who was an insider, never would tell the real reason for a conspiracy. He would give a plausible reason that would allow Norman Dodd to walk away and something that has deceptively deceived uh, many conservative organizations for many years, including the, the John Birch Society, which has done many wonderful things. But it's influenced the Birch Society because of this one quote they have felt for many years that they would never be war between Russia and the United States because the Russians were puppets 
of the Anglo-American establishment. This is what the Ron Gaither quote has led to, that if in fact that the foundations and the powers that be behind the foundations are in control, and that they're controlling both Russia and the United States, there wouldn't be war between them. In fact, in my analysis, this is not true. What is true is that Russia is a separate independent predator, but the Anglo-American establishment using Hegelian conflict creation dialectics want to build Russia so that it will attack because the war itself is useful and that Russia will be eliminated in the process of the war. And um, that's how I think it's going to play out. Competing centers of predator power. And even though they may be temporary alliances, even though may, one may help another, it is not because they control the other, but in fact they are inducing them through that aid to someday strike the West.